Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guests. And in this case, more than intelligence, passion, commitment. We have really the heart of the what exists of a peace movement in the United States. Um, Medea Benjamin, author also of very important books about world conflict from Iraq to Afghanistan, Jody Evans, who has done so much uh, to create uh, Code Pink, along with Medea Benjamin. And I wanted to talk to you guys uh, particularly about where is the peace movement? Uh, we are, um, today is the day after the announcement of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's death. I have a piece about that. I had interviewed him some 40 years ago. Uh, I thought, you know, the Cold War is over, peace would come. It hasn't happened. We're now talking about maybe a nuclear war with Russia without communists, uh, without the Soviet Union. So we find occasion uh, to threaten the destruction of the planet. So let's just begin with that. What happened to the peace movement? <laughs> Jody, why don't you go first? Okay. <laughs> so uh, what happened to the peace movement? The... Um, the peace movement, let's just look at the last 20 years, which is uh, when we started Code Pink uh, in response to Bush's frightening the American people into war on Iraq, an innocent country with his color-coded alerts, orange, red, and yellow, we called Code Pink. Bob, that was 20 years ago. And there were, remember, 12 million people in the streets saying no to that war. And since then, the United States has spent $21 trillion on the war on terror. And we have marched and we have protested and we did, you know, eight nonstop years of disrupting Congress. And um, what happens is you're, you're kind of on, you're up against Teflon. You're up against a Pentagon that is buying up everyone in power. I mean, we just watched a vote on weapons for Ukraine. And I don't know, I, I haven't looked into it, but I don't know in the history of the United States if there was not even one dissenting vote against war and militarism, not one dissenting vote. So we've just watched 20 years of the United States culture being weaponized that, you know, right now, a couple of years ago, I, I launched China's Not Our Enemy because I watched Exactly the same playlist that took us to Vietnam War, that took us to Iraq War, happening towards China. And um, it's the propaganda is so thick that we we people like peace are isn't even in the conversation. So here we are in this, you know, with Ukraine, the, the conversation is about more weapons. It's never about how do we get to peace. So we've watched, we had, uh, you know, the 2006 election where it was all about peace and we got a lot of interesting people in and there was a huge push. And what happens is they all get into Congress and they all vote for a bigger Pentagon budget. And so we've watched, uh, then you've got people that need to be fighting on the fronts of their own communities for their own needs. So the costs of war aren't visible. They're not what people see. They're not what the media is talking about, but we're all experiencing the costs of war, including the planet where war is the greatest contributor to climate change and, and the war machine and those that, you know, line their pockets with it are, are just kind of gone off. And it, there's, it, there seems it's like, it's very frustrating for peace activists because you work and you work and you work and the budget gets bigger and the violence gets more extreme and the effects, you know, looking what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq and what we've done, none of the costs of war are visible. And you've got a whole generation that's grown up since the Iraq war that doesn't know the world without war. So that's kind of the soil we start with. I'll turn it over to Medea. Well, I just want to make one correction, Jody, which is that there were 57 Republicans who voted against that $40 billion. And that's ironic because Republicans are supposed to be the war party and Democrats a little bit less of the war party. But what happens when there's a Democrat in the White House uh, is that the, the Democrats just march in line. And we saw when 
uh, President Obama came in, how the peace movement pretty much fell apart. And we see now under Biden how the overwhelming support of Democrats, not only for the Ukraine uh, $40 billion allotment, in which you're right, Jody, not one Democrat, not even Barbara Lee, no one of the squad stood up and said, uh, negotiations, not more weapons. Uh, but you also have the Pentagon budget continuing to rise. A and so I think this um, bipartisan consensus that you don't want to be seen as, quote, weak on security uh, means that the weapons makers laugh all the way to the bank. Uh, they continue to make uh, obscene profits off of people suffering in misery and that there's no accountability because the media, other than uh, Bob Shear and some others' uh, exceptions, uh, don't go back and look at what happened. We had a, ye a year anniversary of the Taliban being packed back in power in Afghanistan. And so we had a day or two of reminiscing about that war in the mainstream media. But otherwise, it's off the, uh, it it's not talked about. And uh, now we see Iraq. Uh, back in uh, a tremendous conflict, and people uh, really don't care about it. And if they uh, do, they'd scratch their heads and say, I wonder what happened after the U.S. was there for so many years. Why can't they get it together? Uh, rather than recognizing that the U.S. goes into countries and uh, blows them up and tears them apart and leaves them in worse shape than before. So it's hard to um, build a peace movement when, as Jody said, you can't see the immediate costs of the war, although those costs are so uh, evident if you understand what trillions of dollars could do to give us a decent healthcare system, to give us a free college education, not $10,000 off your student loan, uh, and to address the fact that our planet is burning up and we don't know if uh, we will survive as a species. Well, yeah, but let, let me uh, take as, first of all, I, I do want to object to any expectation that the Democrats would not be the war party. Uh, it's true, the Republicans, uh, you know, certainly willing to blow up a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is, Richard Nixon, you know, terrible in so many ways, was the one who did negotiate peace uh, with Mao Zedong. And all this crap now you have to find, you know, you can't negotiate with Putin, who is, isn't a communist. He's quite conservative and, and pro-cartel and everything. But the, and Richard Nixon went. And what was supposed to be the most bloody communist dictator, Mao Zedong, he and Henry Kissinger, and whoever thought we'd now be celebrating Henry Kissinger for making sense in, you know, I think he's almost 100, uh, you know, um, and they went and negotiated. And as a result, we had peace with China until now. Now, uh, the Democrats want to have war with China. Of, of all things, Taiwan, once again, back. And to my mind... Uh, it brings up really George Orwell, because we no longer have, they've forgotten terrorism, that's gone. Uh, we no longer have communists that are really threatening us. I mean, in Russia, it's the anti-communist Putin who, who defeated Gorbachev's side that is, is in there. In China, they're capitalist communists. But it goes back to Orwell's need for our system for an enemy as the great organizing. And it doesn't matter what you call the enemy. And it's always in the name of freedom and our security. And they and they just change. And it's totally cynical. And the Democrats seem to be the main party of war. I know you might not agree with that, but, you know, they're the ones who gave us Vietnam from beginning to end. Well, we have some examples of the Democrats doing negotiating, like Obama negotiating with Iran for the Iran nuclear deal, negotiating with Cuba to normalize relations. But of course, they're both war parties. And um, we don't expect the Democrats to be uh, the party of peace, but we do expect some of the uh, members of the Democratic Party and the ones who call themselves progressives uh, to stand up for a more peaceful foreign policy, where that all falls apart is when you talk about things like Israel-Palestine, uh, where uh, even the progressives don't want to go there because we have allowed uh, APAC and its uh, iterations to be throwing money into our elections uh, to defeat any progressives 
that will come out even for a, a mild statement of supporting Palestinian rights. But yes, uh, uh, Bob, you're right. Of course, we have two war parties. No, but I'm going to push this further because one possibility is if the United States would really believe in capitalism and trade and so forth, then they would worry about how can we get good jobs back and how can we do better uh, capitalism. And if you think China's a threat, well, okay, produce products better, you know, have better workers, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what's going on here now. Uh, we are threatened economically by the uh, vigor of the Chinese economy, so we're going to play the enemy card again. We're going to pick a fight of all things about Taiwan once again, which, you know, my God, they, they had agreed under all these different presidents that, okay, we'll have some kind of accommodation about what is China and its relations. No, we're now actually talking about you know, war with China, war with Russia, in which this guy Putin, whom we backed, you know, I was there at the time covering it for the L.A. Times, you know, and uh, this was the answer to the Soviet Union, Yeltsin and Putin and so forth. No, we're now going to have war, and even nuclear weapons are in play. And so I really want to get back to this notion of Orwell. Maybe uh, um, the American society is sick a at the heart of it that we require an enemy in order to think, in order to feel anything. And we develop all sorts of fantasies about the evil empire that we're opposing, you know, and that's happening once again, a one-sided propagandistic uh, view of what's going on. Well, Bob, but like the we, you know, um, is it, the we is being, um, has been undermined with no investment in education. It's been propagandized. So the we you're talking about, if you're talking about the government or the people, because um, the people are exhausted by all, you know, just look at how hard workers work in the United States with, with so little back and, um, and, you, you've got an exhausted citizenry that is manipulated by, yes, the idea you have, but I think it's it's even just an addiction to war. There's no capacity to, it seems like there's no capacity to stop and see, oh my God, we're running off a cliff with the way we've been doing this. There's no capacity to think about what really security is, which has nothing to do with weapons and war. There's a lie that, you know, is perpetrated within the United States of America that is kind of like seeped into the very sinews of, of what it is to be a citizen and what even you're allowed to say as a citizen when you think of a country made up of so many immigrants and that fear of like being able to stay. So there's so many factors that hold into place a citizenry that you know, believes in its media, even though it's lying to them all the time. I mean, Russians know they're getting propaganda. Americans believe in the media they're getting. So yes, there's an, there's an addiction. There's, I mean, capitalism itself, I call it the war economy, the destructive, extractive, oppressive economy. It is our culture, but it's being driven by those that are making money with it and make and 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 collecting power from it. Time for a break, uh, and we'll be back in a few minutes. We're back with Sheer Intelligence. I want to get Medea into this because one thing you you've also been I shouldn't say just also, but you've been an important. Uh, eyewitness journalists, you've gone to these war zones, you've seen the horror of it, and that there's a horror now going on in the Ukraine. Uh, not the same horror that if the, all life ends, because nuclear weapons are involved and so forth, but we're in another one of these never ending wars. And I, I, you know, now the fantasy is oh, for once we found the good war. We're on the side of freedom and democracy and those bad Russians. They did this without any cause, without any history. We know this is another one of those manipulated events. Uh, the whole thing of, you know, the color revolutions and then, you know, free Ukraine and the role of the CIA and the role. And we saw that in Vietnam. This story gets repeated over and over. I remember when I first went to Vietnam in the early 1960s, that was the whole story. No Dien Diem, South Vietnam, these brave 
brave people fighting these terrible communists from the north. And you know, today, when they bash China, they're saying, move your Apple manufacturing and everything else from communist China to communist Vietnam. We now accept communist Vietnam as the model country in Asia. And when we're rallying everybody, I keep getting back to Orwell. We know it's idiocy. We know you're inventing an enemy. But the point is the media all buys into it. We have a sick culture. And it's a pathetic statement that you made at the beginning of the show. If it's the three of us and maybe another, what, 300 that are saying something and you can't even count on a Barbara Lee to speak up. No, she went with Nancy Pelosi stoking this dispute between China and, and Taiwan, the last thing we need. And one other point I want to throw in and get you to comment on, yes, we have these existential crises in addition to possibility of nuclear war with climate change, with this vast income inequality, uh, with the desire of the U.S. to have a unipolar world when the rest of the world is trying to go its own ways in, in solving some of these problems. And the fact fact of the matter is, we are at a worse situation, I think, than we were at, at the worst moments of the Cold War. But there's just no one speaking out. That's why, in desperation, I turn to the two of you. We're like, <laughs> Thanks, <alone>. Bob. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I've always, no, I, I, I've always admired your work, but I didn't think that, that you were the only ones. You know, I mean, I really, I sat around for the last couple of weeks and I said, where is the peace movement? You know, and I call lots of people and they said, well, you know, this is more complicated and, you know, we have to criticize the Russians more, blah, blah, blah. And I know all that, you know, I know there are no saints in this world uh, other maybe than the two of you. But, you know, the fact of the matter is uh, the absolute silencing of a peace movement and everybody wants to talk once again we're talking about all important issues you know choice and the supreme court and the lesser evil and and the fact of the matter is when it comes to war the democrats are not the lesser evil it was the democrats that dropped the bombs on hiroshima and nagasaki the greatest act of terrorism ever in the world if by terrorism we mean targeting civilians and no one has ever even identifies that as part of the Democratic Party legacy. Well, it's funny when you talk about companies moving from uh, communist China to Vietnam, it makes me think in today's world about moving from not buying Russian oil to buying more Saudi oil. And we see how uh, Biden called Saudi Arabia a pariah state when he's running for office uh, and then goes and does the uh, evil fist bump with Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, and so, yes, the Saudis are the, the good allies who are the brutal, brutal murderers and one of the only absolute monarchies left in the world. Uh, and yet it's the Russians that we have been attacking. Uh, we have been very much uh, opposed to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but we do think it's important that people understand the context for that. Uh, and there Gorbachev comes in, uh, having been someone who really um, uh, took James Baker, Secretary of State, at his word that the uh, NATO was not going to move one inch eastward towards Russia's border. Instead of getting it down in writing, he was way too trusting, a historic blunder. And maybe uh, the uh, Russians wouldn't have invaded Ukraine today if we had gotten that in writing and there was uh, an agreement that NATO would not be expanding the way it did. And then we have the intimate involvement of the United States in the 2014 uh, uh, coup in Ukraine uh, we talk about Russian involvement in U.S. elections, and you have to laugh at that when you see uh, U.S. involvement in things like uh, Ukraine, a coup and deciding who is going to take over afterwards. So um, unfortunately, the American people don't have this context and are too uh, easily duped into seeing the world in these uh, black and white terms. Uh, but I don't want to leave everything so negative, Bob, because Joni and I do have the privilege of uh, working on these issues, working with young people, uh, relating these issues to other things going on in their lives, like uh, the environment. And uh, we do see that in a younger generation, there's a lot of uh, mistrust of the mainstream media. There's a lot of searching for alternative uh, uh, kinds of news. 
And, you know, there are people who really feel like um, the foundations of the system that we're built uh, are absolutely wrong and that they have to look for something totally different. So in that sense, while we don't have a, a large and effective peace movement, uh, we do have a growing movement of young people saying that this uh, kind of capitalist uh, 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 aggressive militaristic society uh, is not one that the world can sustain. Yeah, and this is Jody. I mean, to echo what Medea is saying, and there is a movement out there, and and in ways it's it's um, more connected and um, integrated than we we've been in the last twenty years. But now's a time of teaching. You know, like we said earlier, like what are these costs of war that you can't see? What is the history that you weren't taught? So there are, um, I would say, hundreds of people out in their communities. Our campaigns are based locally. So we're working inside of cities to get them to divest from uh, the weapons or universities to get them as a way to teach. Um, here's where the war comes home to your communities. Um, there We have teaching activities probably once a week on how do you understand this thing you're being used by in the media and take it deeper and learn really what's happening. And there's many, many voices and many amazing organizations that we partner with. Um, you know, we just did uh, the Peace Summit um, in a, as a counter to the Summit of the Americas, and there were 200 um, members of our coalition. So groups are smaller, they were building, creating relationships, building something that um, really needs uh, to be robust to come out what's happening. And also last year on 9-12, as, you know, as we moved out of the 20 years of the war on terror, we launched at the Pentagon, which was the big tent to bring in all the issues that need to cut the Pentagon. It's the militarization of our streets. It's the violence of US immigration policies at our border. It's the starving of the needs of life that, you know, instead we feed the more war and militarism and align the pockets of the rich. So really building amongst our partners um, in, in all the movements, you know, including and especially the movement to save the planet, um, because, you know, really working to teach inside of these movements how those costs, they're, they're, they're bearing, but it's not so obvious from, um, you know, when they're in the fight of just trying to get what they need. So I would say there's just, it's, it's diverse, it's more diverse than it has been in the last 20 years. Uh, the, the depth of education is profound. I mean, we just did two actions outside of Nancy Pelosi's office after she went to Taiwan and they were huge. And the, the, the teaching at the rally was full of depth and understanding and passion. So these things are happening, but they're happening more locally. Uh, you know, we still can't get into Congress except with an appointment. So rallies outside of Congress uh, don't feel useful. Rallies outside of members of Congress's offices in their communities are being much more effective. We just had one in Chicago. It was a weekly vigil outside of a member's office that had him finally surrender to not taking any more money from weapons manufacturers to his campaign. And we have those happening across the country. Uh, we're just launching a new campaign to take on the F-35 and to expose how how ridiculous the building of weapons is, the level of waste and stupidity, and and to build these weapons that then are ineffective and don't even work, like to to be able to build these stories that help everyone understand better what what they're funding with you know sixty percent of their tax dollars. Look, I would shrivel up and die if I didn't know that at least the two of you were still out there trying to organize people. You know, I don't want to surrender to pessimism. And I agree with what you're saying about younger people. I teach at a university. I'll be doing it, you know, until 10 o'clock tonight. And, and my concern about younger people is that 
uh, they're being led to cynicism because they see uh, that, of course, they, the, the Democratic Party uh, is not sincere in any way. I mean, they really, they dropped the ball on immigrants' rights, for example, totally forgotten. That was the big thing they were going to do that was going to be better than Trump. We're arresting more people at the border now before. They they know the, the wars. But, but what I'm concerned about is that uh, they might go to the right. And we've seen this in Europe. Uh, we've seen that the traditional peace, more peace-oriented, social democratic left. I mean, my goodness, uh, in the Cold War, we had uh, uh, the bulk of Germans who didn't want armaments, who didn't want it. Now Europe is being torn apart, and Germany is going to lead the way to militarization, as if the Second World War never happened, you know? And uh, we're, we're getting that. I mean, in England, there's hardly any kind of peace movement uh, when labor shifted in that direction. Uh, there, and here in the United States, any journalist, any writer, anybody who dares to suggest, as we did around Vietnam, that maybe the U.S. position is not so virtuous, maybe the side we're backing is not totally in the right, maybe there's complexity of the kind that Nixon actually embraced at the end, you will be red-baited out, even though Putin was the anti-red. You mentioned Gorbachev. Putin was the guy the U.S. backed to prevent Gorbachev from being uh, Yeltsin and then Putin, to prevent uh, uh, Gorbachev from bringing about the reforms he wanted. And, and the, Yel Putin was the sober alternative to Yeltsin that we backed. But once he asserted that maybe they have some national interest and a different perspective, you know, uh oh, that he becomes the enemy. And I think we're in a very scary situation where uh, red baiting without a red is the fashion. Uh, dismissing any journalist. You have an so organization like Consortium News, which for decades has done excellent reporting, and they're going to be red-baited out of existence. They, they've already denied funding and PayPal and all this stuff. You're getting it everywhere. You get well, our, our best journalist in the country, Chris Edges, you know, former bureau chief for the uh, uh, New York Times, and he now is going to be made into a non-person. You know, uh, even people like Matt Saibi that have a huge following are, are, are being dismissed and so forth. So I just don't want you, I, I know you don't think it, I don't think we should underestimate the danger of this current situation. I don't think we do, but we uh, realize that our job is to mobilize and inspire and organize. And that's why when we're with young people who aren't afraid of the world socialism, in fact, embrace it, and you see that there are chapters of Democratic Socialists of America all over this country, uh, and you see that polls taken show that uh, young people think that we need an alternative to capitalism, uh, that is very hopeful. And the media alternatives that we have, while they are, uh, might be uh, small compared to the Fox News, we see that young people don't watch cable TV. They don't watch Fox News. They don't watch MSNBC. They don't watch CNN. Uh, and so uh, there's a possibility for them to be less polluted by the propaganda. And yes, they could go to the right, but I think the tendency is uh, for young people to search for more progressive alternatives. Uh, and so that does lead, lead us into a, a sense that our, uh, our job is to bring more young people into the peace movement, to keep connecting this movement, as Jody said, to all these other issues, um, and to uh, not let it be that the people from the generation of Vietnam uh, are the ones who are the uh, still uh, the the, um, Paul, the 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 torchbearers for a peace movement? It has to be a movement of young people. Yeah, but okay, well, this might be a good way to wrap it up. But I just want to I I applaud your energy and optimism and and your smarts. And uh, trust me, I hope you're right. But I think. Um, I just never have seen as frightening a situation as this because you take an Ed Markey. It wasn't just Nancy Pelosi went to ten. What is Ed Markey, who as a congressman was one of the few consistent voices warning about 
what a disaster nuclear war would be. The end of all life down to cockroaches. Uh, he was on that. Uh, not one member of, of the squad or any of the others. You talk about, yes, we have people talking about socialism, but what, what has that got to do with it when every single major socialist party in Europe, uh, including the Greens, who aren't socialists, but they're supposedly progressive, have lined up behind war? You know, let's humiliate Russia. When did we ever say that? Let's humiliate Mao Zedong? No, Nixon negotiated with Mao Zedong. Try to figure out what their interests were. If I have to look now at this point in my life at Richard Nixon as a source of inspiration and courage, we are in big trouble, optimism uh, aside. Well, I guess this is Jody. We get to look every day at the passion, enthusiasm, and brilliance of the people that are coming to Code Pink and getting engaged. And people are really reaching out right now, and they're seeing, and they want to get engaged. They want to learn. And so um, maybe we need to invite you to one of our, our gatherings so you can feel the energy out there that is local and is building. Yes, Bob, it is frightening. Everything you say, we look at it, we see what's very scary, and that just, you know, gives us more impetus to continue to, to educate, inspire, and activate, which is the goal of Code Pink. Well, I applaud that, and, and, uh, and I don't, you don't need lectures from me. Uh, you guys have looked at war in the face. Uh, I, 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 haven't, I was going to bring Medea in, but, you know, certainly she's somebody who is in person documented the horror of war. And I, I just want to say, you know, in closing this, it's great that we've got you. Uh, how do they sign up? Uh, Code Pink, uh, is there an email or something? What's the quickie way to sign up? Codepink.org. Okay. And, and you know, I, I, I just want to say, you know, I'm not, look, I, I I'm 86 years old. I'm doing this because I'm worried, but I'm not, you know, I, I believe we can turn this around. I I, 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 I agree with you. My, my students are as smart as any generation I have encountered. What I'm worried about is the smarts become cynical. And they think that we can't do anything. We voted for Obama. We voted for this person and they betray us, you know, and, and uh, so what are we going to do? And cynicism is really the enemy, you know, and uh, whether they go to the right or they just become indifferent, uh, whether they just try to enrich themselves. And I don't blame young people for that because every time, I mean, the idea that there is not one single uh, on the federal level elected Democrat in the Senate or the House let alone the White House, that is talking about peace and negotiation. If we can't negotiate with Putin, and I'll end this show by talking about Gorbachev, that we missed a great opportunity because we undermined, we, meaning the U.S. government, undermined Gorbachev, chose Yeltsin, chose the people who made a coup against Gorbachev. Putin is one of those people we chose. Now they're telling us he's such a monster, you can't talk to him. They're also saying that about the Chinese leadership. And when these so-called liberals, enlightened people, and the Democrats say they can't negotiate, they are not just a war party. They are the main warmongers today, more effectively so than the Republicans. That's my little editorial. I'll give you each the last word, and we'll wrap it up. But I do want to applaud what you guys do. Well, maybe it's not the worst thing for young people to be cynical about electoral politics, uh, as long as they get involved in other kinds of uh, campaigns. And uh, looking at the world, I get inspired because I know that we are the global majority. I just came back from Latin America, and it was so inspiring to see the changes that are going on there because of people power, uh, people coming out on the streets by the tens of thousands, forcing changes in their governments. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we need to do here at home. Oh. Jody, can we end on that or you got a last word? Yeah. And, you know, it's really to not get, um, to not let it affect you and get in community. And I think that's what we've really seen at Code Pink that when you're in community and you can talk about it and share and be engaged together, it keeps you out of that cynicism and depression, which um, is what we're really trying to build a lot in Code Pink. So if you join us, 
we have lots of places where you can engage and be um, in relationship with a beautiful community of peace activists. And Medea is about to go on uh, three months of a book tour with her new book on Ukraine to really get us deep, more deeply educated about the history and Ukraine in ways the media doesn't. So sign up and you can find out when she comes to a community near you. Oh, let me stretch this a little bit. Tell, tell us about the new book before we close, Adia. Well, we, uh, as you, have been seeing uh, how this war in Ukraine has torn apart even people who call themselves liberals, much less progressives, and people being so confused about it. And so we thought it was important to uh, write a book that does lay out the context for this war, that gives people an understanding of the role that uh, NATO has played, the US has played, the uh, Russians have played, the Ukrainians have played, uh, but to really put it in this broader context and then to understand how the U.S. and the U.K. have undermined peace talks, uh, how uh, they have been hell-bent on building up the military in Ukraine for years now, uh, that this is not something that just started when the U.S. invaded in February, uh, and that if we don't want to see this war drag on for years and years with rivers of blood from Ukrainians, um, then we have to do something about it. And we talk in the book about the lack of this democratic response to uh, the massive amounts of money we're pouring in. Where do these weapons go? Uh, what is the role of neo-Nazis? Um, who is, is um, being hurt by these sanctions because uh, they have backfired big time uh, instead of really squeezing the Russians, they're squeezing the Europeans with these uh, enormous energy prices and the global community with the increased prices of grains that have caused a, a massive hunger. So we outline all of this in the, in the book and the whole purpose of it is um, to get people to think, uh, to get them involved and to get them to join in a movement to say uh, no more weapon sales, we demand uh, negotiations. And, and how did they get the book? And what's the title? And who are the other authors? Uh, it's myself and my colleague, Nicholas Davies. It's called War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. It'll be out in the beginning of October by OR Books. Oh, they were a good publisher. They bring out really important work. So, um, okay, maybe I can get a chapter from you or a few chapters to run before then. Um, but we'll look forward to it. So that's all the time we got today for um, sheer intelligence. I want to thank, first of all, our guests, you guys. Okay, you know, I've said it over and over. I can't think of two more useful citizens in this country than Jody Evans, you know, and Medea Benjamin. But, you know, I think a lot of people know that. I want to thank the folks at KCRW uh, for putting these shows, uh, posting them up, these podcasts. Laura Condor Jayan, and uh, I always get the name right, Laura Condor Jayan, and Christopher Ho at KCRW, a terrific NPR station here in Santa Monica, in Los Angeles. Uh, Joshua Shear, our executive producer. Natasha Kimi Zapata, who writes the introduction and the JKW Foundation, which in the memory of a terrific writer and significant, wonderful human being, Gene Stein, helps fund these shows. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. Rien de rien, non, je ne